Hello and welcome to the Curiosity and Consciousness podcast. The intention of this podcast is to open your mind, get curious about yourself and connect to the power you hold within. I am your host, Karen Maloney, an inside out coach, helping you to believe in yourself and manifest your desires. Check out the podcast available on all platforms and go to my website, www.karenmaloney.com for all info. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. It's me, Karen Maloney, and I have another wonderful episode for you today. And today, my guest is Dr. Fred Moss. And Dr. Fred arrived on this earth on the 1st of March, 1958, and from that very second has been earmarked to be a healer. The family he was born into was in chaos and in many ways was counting on his arrival to bring health and wellness back into balance. Little Freddie had his hands full and over the next six decades, he has made it his business to bring healing to the world around him, not only to his family and friends, but to the community and world at large. And what a journey it has been. Dr. Fred has had a host of life experiences, including, among other things, being a two-time college dropout and a Northwestern University Medical School graduate. Over the last four decades, he has been firmly entrenched in the mental health system, first as a childcare worker and then as an internationally well-known psychiatrist. He has been committed to the notion that communication, connection, creativity and conversation are at the heart of all healing, of all conditions, of all types. Without this, people simply do not heal. With it, miracles regularly occur. And Dr. Fred's life mission has now become to assure that all people know that who they are and what they do matters and that their voice, no matter where they are from or where they are going, can be heard. As the founder of the Welcome to Humanity movement and the True Voice podcasting mastermind and methodology, Dr. Fred now finds himself making the difference he came here to make. His years in the community where he has been a physician to over 40,000 patients and his storied and adventurous life traveling around the world has now left him uniquely qualified to remind us all of what we already know. Communication is where love arises from and speaking truth and listening authentically are the source of that love. I absolutely loved this conversation with Dr. Fred, who's also known as the recovering psychiatrist and the undoctor, because as he shared throughout the conversation as well, and from his 40 years within the mental health sector and what he saw and what he had to do and diagnose people and label people and prescribe medications and how it really didn't agree with his soul, but also he knew For the most part, it did not help and sometimes made people even worse. So he left traditional methodologies and actually started taking people off their medication and discovered that creative self-expression and communication and conversation and connection were vital for healing and actually how miraculous healing can happen really quickly when these things are looked at and I agree with so much of what he said especially looking beyond labels and diagnoses and the idea that nobody is broken not any single human is broken no matter what they have experienced but unfortunately as he talks about as well the system doesn't see humans and maybe that's why it's easier to look at labels and diagnoses but that's not what truly helps people to heal or what provides long-term healing. So honestly, there is so much in this episode. And again, he talks about how a root of all issues is this inability or this feeling of not being heard or not being seen for who we are and how this self-expression is critical and how when we are creating because we're we're creators we're here to create when we are creating all our uncomfortableness goes away and he invites and says and has put into practice again and again with many clients that even three minutes a day 
of doing some form of creation, whether it's dance, art, music, being in nature, gardening, singing, doing it three minutes a day will provide profound effects and healing. So a wonderful conversation with lots of takeaways. And Dr. Fred has kindly offered every listener as well a copy of his new book, which is called Find Your True Voice. And that's available for free for everyone. An actual physical copy of the book will be shipped to you if you go to the website findyourvoicebook.com. Put in your address and you will receive a free copy of the book. You can find more on Dr. Fred's work on his website, welcome to humanity.net. And you can email Dr. Fred at drfred at welcome to humanity.net if you would like a free discovery call as well. But as always, I will have links to everything from the show notes on my website, karenmaloney.com and click the podcast section and Dr. Fred's episode. And just finally, before jumping into this episode, or just to let you know that I am doing a silent counselling relaxation evening online on Wednesday, the 20th of July at 7.30 p.m. British Standard Time. It's for an hour. It's relaxation. It's a rapid energy release modality working on different meridians. We will do a short guided visualization, relaxation, connecting with our inner child. And then I will guide you to hold different meridian points, acupressure points on your body to release any tension or stress or fears. So go to my website, karenmaloney.com, click the shop section and you will see it there. I look forward to seeing you. And other than that, enjoy this episode. Hello, hello, everybody. You're very welcome. And thanks for tuning in and joining for another episode. And today I have Dr. Fred Moss joining me. So first of all, thank you for joining and you're very welcome. It's really great to be here. Thank you for having me. I can't wait to have our conversation. I've been looking forward to this for a while. So thanks again for having me as a guest. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it as well. Um, You know, going through your information and your work and your website, I'm excited to delve deeper. And, you know, maybe if you share some of your background first of what brought you to your work and even the fact of calling yourself like the undoctor or the recovering psychiatrist, I love that as well. So we're all excited to hear and learn more today. But yeah, if maybe you just share some of your background and your journey to this work. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So I, you know, I was born, uh, born to be a communicator, born to be a mm-hmm. connector. I really was actually. And I, I mean, what I mean is, there were four people in my family waiting for me to pop out because that's what they were expecting me to be able to do. They were, uh, I had a brother 10 years older than me and 14 years older than me. And, you know, they're still 10 and 14 years older than me, despite (laughs) my efforts to try to catch up with them. And, uh, you know, they were in disarray. They were in some chaos. The home was, uh, as I hear, uh, it was in a a fair amount of uh, trouble, a fair amount of challenging uh, agitation and uh, uh, strife. And what was being asked of me was to show up as a bundle of joy and to show up as a connector, to show up as a communicator, and to somehow give uh, a new purpose to that life. And so I've really been doing that since the moment that I've arrived. And uh, I really loved communication. I loved to see how people talked and listened to each other. And I wanted to learn how to do that. And I remember, you know, vividly from the playpen, watching my brothers and parents speak, uh, even after my younger sister was born, and really, really just wanting to learn how to do that in the very best way, realizing that that's what life seemed to circle around. When I finally went to kindergarten, you know, you could guess my brothers had given me all sorts of skills and tools. I knew how to read a little bit. I knew how to do math flashcards. And I, I you know, I was kind of advanced in my education. Um, and so my kindergarten friends, none of them could do that. You know, they just liked throwing blocks and and picking their nose and waiting for the afternoon nap. And, you know, I, I also like throwing blocks, picking my nose and, and waiting for my nap, but I would like to read and I would like to talk. So I got in a fair amount of trouble when I was a elementary school student because I, I talked a lot. And, you know, the teachers, there's no teacher who had me who will forget having Fred Moss as their, as a student. And uh, I really just wanted to learn how to communicate. And I had, wanted to have fun doing it. So we fast forward a little bit and you see that, in junior high, it didn't get that much better. And in high school, it actually got a little bit worse. And then I decided that it must be college where you learn how to communicate. 
Uh, so I went to the University of Michigan because I really liked their football, football helmets and because they were only 40 minutes away. And I really thought that that was where I would learn how to finally communicate. But it didn't happen there either. And in the classrooms, I learned that what they really wanted me to do was sit down, be quiet, and then regurgitate whatever the professor said as accurately as possible. And if the best I could do in mimicking them, that would allow me to get a good grade and move forward. And that just seemed entirely ludicrous. So I dropped out of college, Karen, I, and I uh, got on a bus and, and, and you know, did what any self-respecting dropout would do in the late 70s and got on a Greyhound bus and went all the way to Berkeley, California, where I wanted to learn who I was. And I uh, spent the summer there in a hostel and did learn a little bit about who I was, but I didn't have a job or anything, you know, any uh, sustainability. When I called home, my mom told me to come back, you know, get a get a, a degree and then go out and find myself. So I fell for that joke. I went, came back and went into uh, went back to Ann Arbor. And I had heard about this new up, up and coming industry called computer science. Uh, no one, you know, there was no computers anywhere. The only computer in the entire state of Michigan was in Ann Arbor. And I began to take on computer science and, you know, spend the nights in that computer building. It was two acres of a building and we just did punch cards and waited to see if the batch run. And uh, that seemed like it wasn't going to be a good career either for me. So eventually I dropped out of school for the last time. And I just told, came home and I said, you know, I'm not going to go to school. I mean, it's a stupid waste of time. So my mom got me a, an application to start working at a state hospital, a state mental health hospital for adolescent boys. And for the first time ever, I was communicating and getting paid for it and actually healing myself and others as a result of that connection. These kids were only six or seven years older, younger than me, and, and there was nothing that wrong with them at all. They were just, uh, they had a life that had led them to the state hospital. I loved what I did, but I really didn't like the way psychiatry was treating these kids because all we'd have to do is call a psychiatrist on the phone and he'd come from the call room and, and you know, we'd say like Timmy was up too late or Johnny and Jimmy got in an uh, argument. And before too long, he'd take out his pen and he would write something in the chart and then we'd have to go find Jimmy hold him down on the ground much against his will while he's spitting, kicking, biting, screaming, all that. And then we'd fill his hip with a, uh, to you know, with a, with a toxic medication, with an antipsychotic, you know, an adult dose of toxic antipsychotic injection. And I did that many times, sometimes several times a day, and I just hated doing it. And by the way, that's still happening in our hospitals to this very day. Um, I finally made it my business that I wasn't going to simply allow that to happen. And then it was important that I bring communication back into mental health. And I went back to school one more time. Now, over the next 13 years, my whole objective was to stay a child care worker and then get a degree as a psychiatrist, come right on through, finish my degree, go to medical school, get my residency, internship and fellowship. And that actually is what I did over the next 13 years, graduating from Northwestern and then University of Cincinnati. Before too long, I had this killer practice, you know, several thousand patients and, and really just moving it. But in the meantime, Prozac was initiated to the world. It was, it was uh, you know, was introduced. And Prozac, I'm guessing you might be too young to know this, but Prozac really changed everything. I mean, Prozac made psychiatry into a biological field, into a, you know, chemical imbalances. And prior to that, that isn't how people talked. So in order to be an expert psychiatrist, all of a sudden, what was I doing? I was doing what I hated doing more than anything, which was medicating everybody. And not only was I medicating everybody, I was actually diagnosing people with things that I didn't even think they had because I had people were just who they were and I didn't like diagnosing. But I came a big expert as a, uh, diagnostic, uh, as a diagnostician and a medication provider. Now, this is a significant amount of duplicity, right? Like this is somebody who's doing something not consistent with who they were. And that's really what I did, trying to inject communication, but still at the same time realizing that that isn't what was called for from a psychiatric, psychiatric position. In 2006, uh, almost 15 years after I had become a psychiatrist, I finally started doing something radically different, which was... I took people off their medicine. I actually took them off their medicine. I took the right crowd of low risk folks off their medicine and they got better. Uh, they got way better and they got reliably way better. And many times their whole diagnosis just simply disappeared into thin air. I started doing this with a greater number of people. And before too long, I really realized that, I could, that almost everyone got better if you took them off medicine, suggesting that medicines maybe weren't doing what, that, what they were supposed to do. Instead, they were either keeping people sick or maybe sometimes even creating their own problems. Now, this was, you know, I was 
angry about it first. And then I said, what am I going to do about this? Because, you know, I, I can't just scream it from the mountaintops. And over the next 15 years, uh, up until just recently, I finally kept on backing out. And really, that's how I became the um doctor. That, that moment in time, I call that my true voice moment, where I turned into a healer instead of a doctor, where I started to really stand for creativity, communication, conversation, and connection at the heart of all healing. And I really love that. I really do think connection is at the heart of all healing of all conditions. And I'm now a deep stand for that. Welcome to Humanity was developed in 2016. It's a self-explanatory brand. And basically what it says is that each and every experience we have as a human is exquisite in its own right. Even if it's highly uncomfortable, even if we're totally angry or afraid or anxious or depressed, even if we're even hearing voices or confused or not finishing tasks or not sleeping well, or we're stealing or we're ruining relationships, all of those things are indeed part of what it means to be human. And so this welcome to humanity was a really good way to be with people, not as a diagnosis, but as a human being. I have finally started to be a progressive and expected healer in this setting. Once I start really looking at people for who they are, for instance, you know, you would be, your diagnosis is Karen, that's it. That's your only diagnosis. You don't have, I don't care what doctor has ever told you anything about what you think you have. The truth is you don't have a mental health diagnosis necessarily. Now, for the listeners out there who are sure that they do and they fight for their right to carry their diagnosis and all that, and they have found some peace and truth inside their diagnosis and whatever their treatment is, I'm, I'm you know, good, like seriously good. Like don't, don't give it up just because of what I'm saying. I'm talking to the hundreds of millions of people who are pretty sure that they are not diagnosed properly and maybe that there's nothing wrong with them and instead there's things wrong with the world. Karen, have you noticed there might be things wrong with the world? I just noticed that recently. <laughs> that yeah. there's, reason, there's reason to believe that there might be something wrong with the world. I'm not positive mm -hmm. about it, but I have early evidence that suggests to me that there's things that aren't going on in the world which are not that good. Yeah. And that we can respond by being depressed, anxious, afraid, et cetera, is probably an act of an actually healthy human being responding effectively to what's not working in the world. When we really start looking at this honestly, healing starts taking place. And I'm saying miraculous healing, healing that can take place instantaneously and very quick, very fast. I like to call it rapid restorative healing, healing that brings us back to the truth that who we are is okay as we are, no matter if we disagree with someone or we think someone is bad or wrong or, or different. Um, the idea here is that all of these are human experiences. So now I step into now where I really am just a proponent of this whole idea of helping people find their true voice and then deliver it effectively into the world. We all have things that we're not saying anymore. You know, the collective consciousness has been told to stop speaking their truth. And many of us have really started biting our tongue. We're afraid that we're going to be uh, ostracized or canceled or censored or pushed off the island one way or another. So we're no longer speaking our truth. We're staying quiet when we know you should talk or we're saying things that we don't even agree that we don't even agree, you know. Um, and I think this uh, this is really important to realize. And once once we start looking, once there's a big group out there who is real, and there is a big group who's ready to finally say what matters to them into a world that's eager to receive it, that's when I step in now. I really help those people find and deliver into their true voice by digging into what really matters to them and then speaking it openly and honestly into that world so that the difference that they came here to make or so that the statements they became here uh, to launch actually get received and heard effectively for being who these people are. Uh, and that's really where we stand right now. I'm a teacher. I'm a consultant. I'm an expert speaker. So I do signature and keynote speeches uh, along these same lines. I'm a writer. My, I know I got. I worked really hard for the title of my last book. Um, I'll surprise you with it now. The title of my book is called Find Your True Voice. And I know that's a shocking title, but it's actually the only title that made any sense. And uh, that book is really fun to read. And, and, and then I have a course and you might be able to guess what the course's name is too um, uh, at this point. And it is, it's called the True Voice Course. I, I know it's stunning, right? I mean, it's mm -hmm. so creative, so creative to call it that. It just got unleashed. Uh, just actually this week, I finished the 54th module. So it's ready to go. And uh, the 54th lesson, there's, there's not, there's six modules with nine lessons in each of them. And uh, it's exciting. So the, that's who I am. As I run masterminds, I do consultant work, speaker work, advisor work. 
workshops, et cetera. And now I'm finally really am doing the work that I came here to be the one that my parents and my brothers were hoping that I've become 64 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you for sharing all that. That's like the full, the whole yeah, the sum total. Job, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> from from start to finish. But I love how you mentioned that. Well, so much there that you touched on is just like, for me anyway, makes a lot of common sense. And but just interestingly, how you know, when you said right at the beginning, that you knew that you were asked to be that ray of light within that family. When did you realize that? <laughs> I, you know, when, <laughs> that's a really f interesting question. No one's asked me that one directly. Here's what I have. I think I realized it just in the last couple of years when I when I started actually speaking and you know really looking back at well how did how did I get to be the undoctor how did I get to be rapid what happened when did this all start and I you know be like oh it started when I dropped out of school no 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 it started when I started uh, looking when I was communicating uh, no it started when uh, I was in kindergarten no 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 it started when I was in the playpen and I watched my brothers and parents talk. No, it actually started before then um, when I was brought, oh, listen at this. I can really see, almost see my brothers waiting for me to pop out so that I could finally bring peace uh, to a family that was in massive, uh, you know, massive disarray. And I started getting really that that's, that's been my role, no joke, mm -hmm. from the first second I arrived on earth. Cool. I got goosebumps as you said that. Um Again, so much of what you shared is just really fascinating, but even maybe to share a little bit with listeners as well as because I'm sure a lot of listeners as well are in the age demographic that maybe they just know Prozac uh, or whatever medication it is as a treatment to depression or men mental illness or whatever they're suffering from. But what was it like for you pre Prozac and then when Prozac came along? Well, you know, pre-Prozac, that's a good question too. Uh, you know, in 1980, when I dropped out of school, there were, it isn't like Prozac was the first medicine. It was mm -hmm. not the first medicine. So, you know, we were giving Haldol and Ativan and Cogentin uh, as an injectable cocktail to those kids uh, in 1979, 1980. And really the medicines go back to the 40s. So, uh, and even before that, but va Valium and Thorazine and Elevil, these are medicines from the 1940s. And so I knew that the medicines were out there, but they were actually held for supposedly for institutionalized, long-term institutionalized patients specifically, and only one medicine at a time, by the way. This idea of taking a whole handful of medicine is a new phenomenon since I became a psychiatrist. You know, life was what it was beforehand. I was very, very interested in communication as a healing tool, so enough so that I wanted to go and eventually be a psychoanalyst, uh, analyst, I mean, one, one who I didn't need to prescribe medicine, but knew that the conversations and connection could actually heal all, all conditions. However, you know, by the time I started working in order to pay off my education or in order to learn a little bit more about the field I was about to endeavor into, I really learned that the medicines were, a, were driving force and that there was a, 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 when they started creating other mental health professions besides psychologists and psychiatrists, when social workers and licensed counselors and, uh, you know, marriage counselors and, and, nurse practitioners and physician's assistants and all sorts of other, you know, clinical workers, et cetera, uh, got created. What became very clear is that the psychiatrist is only called, is only referred when communication already has been tried, supposedly, and, does, and didn't work. So not only did I become sort of the, you know, a, an expert in this thing that I didn't really agree with entirely, but I wasn't even really allowed to use communication as a primary tool for healing, you know, because this was already done by all the people below me. So everyone, you know, a, a social worker or a psychologist or the like would, in, would refer patients to me saying they had already tried psychotherapy and talk therapy and all. And that isn't what they wanted from me. They didn't want me to take, you know, another three or six or 10 weeks to try talking to the client. They already had supposedly determined that talking wasn't gonna work and all we could do was bang these clients with medication. So over the next 30 years, I wrote for over 100,000 medication uh, prescriptions and I had over 40,000 patients that I could call my own, at least for one second in time, you know, entering their chart with a note. Um, many of those patients were, you know, with me telling them they had a diagnosis, which I wasn't, certainly wasn't sure they had, 
And in many cases, giving them medicines where I really knew that it wasn't going to do the trick. And if anything, uh, really could actually make them slightly worse or significantly worse. And this way of life was very difficult on my soul until I decided to start uh, turning around and becoming a little bit more aligned with who I really honestly knew myself to be. And facing the fact that I was now, uh, you know, banging the beat of a different drummer. Um, and again, you know, that's what your soul was calling. But again, some would see it as brave because in a system where it's just not done. And I, I remember I had a very uh, well-known mental health doctor as well from Ireland join me before. And, you know, the reality was he left a booming practice. It was really easy to make a lot of money. But again, like that just didn't sit with his soul. So why do you think as well so, well, I don't want to ask why so many stay in that practice because again, mm -hmm. you know, it's each person's decision. But maybe what then did you see from your techniques and you've mentioned communication as a healing tool several times and what did you see helping people over and over again that maybe when they tried other talk therapies and had no success, what was it for you in your practice that really helped people to maybe unburden themselves and begin to like that come off medication and feel better? Here's what's different. It's a good question again. Um, here's what's different. Most therapists are really, uh, they're in, still in the school of thought that there's something wrong with the client and that they have, you know, they have something to do like a go-to, like a, like a, they can always punt it up to the psychiatrist. You know, if they, if it doesn't work, they do what they do. If it doesn't work, they just punt it up to the next most powerful space in the totem pole. The difference is that therapists tend to create a relationship that is ongoing and perpetual. It's very rare that a therapist takes on a client with the intention of letting them go very soon after seeing them. So with me, that's not the case. I'm super interested in having short-term therapies, meaning really short-term, like, you know, three to six months at the very most, if, uh, if we're going to do anything about people getting that there was nothing wrong with them. But the real key here and this is what's different between most talk therapies and what I'm doing is I don't start off with a diagnosis at all. I don't care what you think you have. I, I really don't. I don't care if everybody under the planet has told you you have major depression. I don't care. That's not, that doesn't mean anything to me. The idea that you're depressed might just be, a, be a, the proper way of looking at a world in your way of thinking that is absolutely depressing. It's okay to be depressed. That's one of the many emotions that's available as a human being. It's not something wrong with you for having uncomfortable experiences. There's nothing wrong with you if you're miserable. There's nothing wrong with you if, the, if your emotions are taking you to places you wish that they wouldn't. That doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. That just means that's what your emotions are doing. And that's what you're agreeing to allow to be who you see yourself as. When we start looking that there might not be a diagnosis underneath this and that people in and of themselves are just who they are and not in any way a mental illness, even if they do really stupid stuff, you know, just because someone does stupid stuff also doesn't necessarily make them mental ill. And mental illness is an overused concept because we, ha we think we have some sort of inside track on what mental wellness is. But I've never really heard anybody speak to a truth of what it means to be normal. Never. And, and so, you know, what's normal here in California might not be normal in Arkansas or UK or Australia or, you know, or Singapore, or Norway or, you know, uh, Johannesburg. It's different. It's culturally different. You know, when you have a broken arm, it's broken in all of those cities. It doesn't matter what city you're in. You have a broken arm. But when you're thinking or behaving or having certain types of emotions, that does not make you sick in every culture. It's actually culturally specific. Now, if that's true, that there's so many definitions of mental illness, then there isn't any, right? If you can define something in multiple ways, it means that there's no definition for that thing. And that's really what I like to think is that what makes my work a little bit different is not only do I have the 40 years of experience. But I really tend to look across at you or my client or, you know, whatever, whoever has decided to work or play or partner with me as another human being just as much struggling to figure out what the hell's going on as I am. 
just as much not knowing the future and really not knowing anything as I am. No one knows anything. Did you get that? No one knows shit about yeah. anything. It, 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 all the, everyone's so sure they know shit, especially mm-hmm. the people who know that they know shit. They're the most dangerous of all of us. Yeah. And when we really can get used to the fact that we don't know anything, including all the stuff that we know that we know that we we don't know that shit either. Mm -hmm. When we really get that now, aren't we just one tribe trying to figure out how to make it in a world that is confused and and getting more confusing? And Mm -hmm. it's always been confused and getting more confusing. It's just a little more confusing now than it was before. But it's it's always been, you know. Yeah, I I love that. And I love what you shared as well, because, again, I do not believe in labels in any way, shape or form. And that idea of being broken. And that was something I had written on my page here before you mentioned it, uh, you know, this idea that we're broken and we need fixing. And again, it's human experiences and we're all experiencing so many different experiences. But hey, this is part of the journey to experience all experiences. And again, it comes down to our own mindset and how we're perceiving them and how we're interpreting them. Um, but again, you know, we're, we're not taught that in school or mainstream to have these life skills, I call them to be able kind of unravel ourselves and you know like that as well I don't believe in long-term therapy again it's just other forms of codependency Mm -hmm. and then what have you seen as well or what do you know but don't know for sure as the the root cause really that it comes back to again and again for people who like that may be feeling like they're in a hole or there's nothing good what does it all come down to in the root great question this one I'm at least prepared to answer. So this one, if if it had to come down to one thing, it's the idea that somehow we are not being heard for who we are. Self-expression is very critical. And we tend to lean on this whole idea of talking to each other. Like right now, we think we're communicating with each other. The truth is neither of us can see each other. We can't touch each other. We can't smell each other. We certainly can't taste each other. And All that's left to do is listen to each other. And we think that that's good enough to call it a communication or to call it an effective, you know, conversation. Now, the truth is, it's a very limited way to have to communicate. Not only do I have to design my whole words on a fly and then string them together in sentences and then put together ideas and then try to explain what my ideas are effectively Then I got to wing them at this screen and hope that all the technology works that including the invisible technology for the thousands of miles that separate me and you. Then it has to land on those things called your ears with whatever kind of dialect you're speaking and all what you've heard and what you've not heard about different phrases. I have to hope that you have heard the same thing about particular words. So you think Mm -hmm. what I say is pretty close to what you mean. Blah, 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 right? And we count on that as being our primary form of communication. How could there not be massive, massive, massive misunderstandings inside of that system? Mm -hmm. The idea is that self-expression and not being heard for who we are and who we're not is the source of so much of our, our psychological, emotional, and even physical and spiritual pain. We all just want to be heard more than anything else. And we want to be loved, but we want to be heard for what it is that we have to say, for what it is that we stand for. And mental illness, if you will, or mental discomfort, mental unpleasantness, almost always comes from the idea that our self-expression has been thwarted. That's why I wrote my first book. My first book talks about the creative eight, meaning eight different ways, and it's now grown to 12, that you can express yourself over and above voice that actually bring an end to this whole notion of mental illness while you're doing them. So art, music, dancing, singing, drama, cooking, writing, gardening, those kinds of things, while you're doing them, while you're creating your symptomology, if you will, your tendency towards being unpleasantly uncomfortable goes away while you're being a creator. So that's because while you're being a creator, you're actually uh, performing some massive degree of self-expression. And that's what we're here to do. So when we're not being heard or frankly, not hearing another, right? And you hear that these are the, these are the ingredients that go into this whole idea of being connected, right? Conversation, connection, communication, the same things I spoke of before. That's when we get the discomfort. That's when we get that it doesn't matter anyways, that it's, you know, we get maybe cynical or we get Mm -hmm. negative. I say that more often than not, way more often than not, any kind of psychological discomfort or any kind of sense that we're depressed or anxious is a function that we don't feel like there's a place for us to speak into. We don't feel like there's a place 
for us to say what we mean. And we don't feel like there's a chance that we're going to be heard for what it is we really want to want to represent. Yeah. Um, and I love that little monologue or analogy or whatever you want to call it of, you know, the, the process of you stringing words together and sending it through a microphone and, you know, having it land, whether in my ears, listeners ears, and then you hoping that it's going to be interpreted in the way that you're thinking that you're creating the meaning. And again, it's this idea of, well, I don't know how you think about it, but as in this idea that we live from an inside out world, it's it's all exactly. based on the inside. And hence, when our inside is in chaos, or we're really disconnected from ourselves or have these horrible stories about ourselves, they're going to perpetuate into every aspect and infiltrate into every aspect of our lives because they're like the filter that we have that we're filtering everything through that we hear. And I remember a couple of years ago, I, I got this message so strongly and it was just like, oh, it's me talking to me all the time all the time. Because like that, even when I'm listening to you, I'm listening to you, but I'm still interpreting it through my own filters. So it's like me talking to me the whole time, me talking to me, this is why I need to clean up me. Um, Then, you know, you've mentioned obviously as well, you know, the communication side of things, the self-expression, the creativity. How then, or are there some practical steps as well that you can share with people to help them to Again, you know, maybe even just get a tiny glimmer of some ease within themselves. And as the Course in Miracles calls it, you know, this psychic pain that we we all suffer, but we all have a choice and a way out as well. Yeah, I think the best way to do this is it it comes out of my book. At least it's the easiest. For me, it still remains the easiest one that I've heard of. It's the one I created in The Creative Eight. And that is if you take one of those uh, particular practices, so we'll call the base eight, art, music, dancing, singing, drama, Mm -hmm. cooking, writing, and gardening. If you do any one of those for simply three minutes a day, I mean it, three minutes. If you take out a pencil and you draw for three minutes, or if you take out a coffee can and bang on it for three minutes, or if you close the door and dance in your room for three minutes. If you, uh, you know, if you go out and put your hands in some dirt, do some gardening for three minutes. We tend to activate a whole new sense of what it means to be a self-expressed human being. The, once we do that, the, the, even if we're feeling lousy, the amazing, and you called it miracle, but the amazing healing that takes place instantaneously can become pretty contagious and pretty, pretty uh, infectious and uh, pretty attractive and pretty addicting. So I ask people to do three minutes a day. And what I do is pick any three of these and just do it for one minute. One minute on each of them, like, you know, want to dance for a minute, sing for a minute and do art for a minute. That's perfect. And just doing that once a day and reminding yourself that you have some access to how you express yourself and that you're actually way better at it than you thought you were. And there's nothing truly in the way. Mm. Then you get access to a fair amount of healing in that very day without ever having to go into psychoanalysis or go you know, take a bunch of medicine or move to Tibet or anything. You don't have to do all that shit at all. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's so true. And I have experienced profound shifts in my life as well from, you know, doing these quote unquote simple things. You know, they are simple, but again, it's on us to actually do them and to do them consistently and, you know, to make it a priority so we can feel the benefits because cognitively we might understand, oh yeah, that's, that's really relaxing or whatever. But again, it's the inner shift. And even for you, when you do your practices, whatever they are, whether it's one of those or it's evolved to something else, maybe even what is your favorite daily technique and then what happens for you inside when you do it and you know after doing it as well for a period of time well let's say um i think what happens to me after i do it is there is i don't always notice and this is really important i don't always notice while i'm doing it that it's having the profound positive effect that it is It usually does take till afterwards where I start realizing that, oh, I've given myself a little break here. Oh, I have, look at the uh, masterpiece that I just created by doodling or uh, look at that music I just created by, uh, uh, you know, picking up a harmonica. Um, I want to just like say that there's a piece that sets in, a little bit of a greater piece that sets in. Something that really calls me forward that, that in fact, maybe I have something to offer other people, 
but also something that instead of staring down the barrel at a life that sure looks grim and bleak if I want it to, right? Have you noticed that you can do that anytime you want? For sure. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. It would take like, it takes like one second to create a future that is absolutely ridiculously Mm -hmm. horrible. You, You get how that goes. Yeah. And, you know, that's the unfortunate thing. Why do we choose to live in that space more often than not? In that mm-hmm. grim, negative, depressive, seeing <laughs> the world as the horrible place that, well, again, it can be. And there's lots of challenging and horrific things happening. But again, why do we choose to live there, do you think, more often than not? Until well, we don't. Yeah, I, 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 you could make a case that it is the default, that if we don't mm-hmm. do anything, that's just what happens is we end up sort of rotting. It's like if a, if a plant doesn't get watered, it dies. You know, if we don't do anything, then we will rot. And we, that's just how life goes is that it takes intentionality. It takes watering our plant. It takes actually stepping in and creating flow. It takes drinking our water and watching what we put in our mouth or what we put in our eyes. It takes, you know, really being with another person and and helping another person and uh, being compassionate and accepting and forgiving. To be a human being, it takes something. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that, you know, left alone, you have it together that you're going to be okay. No, actually, if you don't do shit, then you're going to get a bad life. Mm. Uh, You know, you're going to get a life that you you just are. I mean, it's, you could say, well, why are we going to get a bad life? Oh, no, one, that's not really an important question at that moment. All I'm just telling you is if you don't step up out of the default and actually take care of yourself even a little bit by mindfulness or movement or uh, conversations or, or creativity, uh, then what you're going to get is a life that doesn't work. And we all know that because some days we wake up and we just give up. We don't even do those things, right? We just mm-hmm. don't do them. You just sit on the couch, maybe watch too much TV, shower late, maybe eat a, a bunch of junk for lunch, or maybe have a drink or some of your favorite uh, intoxicants or something. And and then you, wake, you go to sleep. And by the time you go to sleep, you're like, wow, life sucks a lot. And you're like, yeah, but you didn't do anything. Mm-hmm to actually bring pleasure and joy, which, which is always right available right around the corner. You do something, you do something good in the world. Doesn't have you noticed that the universe pays you back like 10 X or hundred X, like fairly instantaneously. It gives you stuff that you had no idea was coming. Yeah. And that's true for all of us. Yeah. Um, again, and you know, I love what you share as well, that often the effect of doing, you know, your three minutes, it's so subtle. And that has 100% been my experience as well. You know, it, it seems like nothing is happening sometimes, but then I, you know, might take a pause a month or a couple of months later and I'm like, oh, wow, I actually feel totally different. It's so subtle. And, you know, I think that's a really, really, really powerful message as well to end our conversation on as well. Intentionality. That's exactly it as well. You know, like you say, every choice is available, whether we want to live in the shit or we want to do something to make ourselves feel better. And that doesn't have to be a massive leap from fear to love or ecstasy straight away. But like you're even saying, those few moments of mindfulness, of some creativity, some space, um, intentionality. I love that. So Dr. Fred, I could keep talking as well. And I've really enjoyed this conversation. And I think the dogs around me have as well. I don't know if they're they're coming through in the microphone. But please, if there's anything else that you feel called to share yet in the conversation, please do. And please also share where people can find out more in your work. Sure. So it look, it, it, this idea of being aligned with who I am is a, I invite everybody to come here. Mm. Uh, whatever it takes to take steps towards being more aligned than who you have been the first thing you're going to have to do is realize there are great parts of your life for which you're not aligned. And you got to be kind to yourself about that. There, you have learned over time that being someone different than you are is somehow more safe than being you. And that's actually just a ludicrous, preposterous and ineffective way of dealing with life. But it's okay because that's what we learned early on and we never just went back to repair it. So the idea now is that it can be repaired. And the way to be prepared, repaired is to start really accessing that self with is really your true voice. And then bringing that true voice forward and launching it to a world that is eager to listen to. And that's all that really the true voice technology and methodology is about. So my new book is Find Your True Voice. And uh, you can get that book for free. I'm going to give it to your listeners for free, actually. Mm -hmm. They can find it at findyourtruevoicebook.com. That's findyourtruevoicebook.com. And if they plug their name and their address in there, I'm actually going to cover shipping as well in this country. 
Um, and uh, I think the way it's set up, I'm actually now plugging it for all countries. So oh, wow. um, the idea is that I would ship this book to you and you take a look at it. It's a deeper dive into what we're talking about and what this whole community uh, really is about. We're building a community. The course that I just said, the True Voice course, is ready to go. We are ready to have you really get access to what matters to you and then speak it. Sometimes for the first time in your life, you might be mid-age, you might be a parent you know, uh, with empty nest. You might be divorced already. You might even be retired. And now it's time to start speaking your true voice. This is what we do now. The community is a, is a community of like-minded individuals who are super interested in authentic messaging uh, delivery and then in listening authentically to others so that we know how to move that needle forward. So if you want to talk to me a little bit more, you can do that by writing me directly at drfred at welcometohumanity.net. Or you can go to my website and my website, you can get a, um, you can get access to a discovery call, which is uh, uh, also really something that's normally a, a $200 value. Um, and in that discovery call, we can really take a look at, uh, you know, what is it, what is it you want? What is it you want for yourself? What is it that you want for um, other folks? What is it that you're really, really looking to bring to the world? So that's that's really, really what we're about. That's what mm -hmm. I'm super interested in. And it's time for you to step in and really, really uh, ask yourself, where is it that you're not being heard for who you are? And this is what the, the True Voice Broadcasting, True Voice Podcasting, where I teach podcasting, you can find us there as well. And in the True Voice community, which you can presently find on Facebook which is a group that's really aligned with not only showing you how to be your true voice, but with other people who are doing it because authenticity is more powerful than simply agreeing with somebody. And the idea is that we're all compelled to someone speaking from their heart. And even if someone diametrically opposed to you in the content, if they're speaking from their truth, have you noticed that you're much more able to listen to them, even if they're mm -hmm. saying something you radically disagree with. Yeah. So yeah. we're all about authenticity. Yeah, for sure. And um, thank you so much. And um, thank you as well for kindly offering the book as well to for free for all listeners. And I will link everything as always in the show notes from my website as well. But Dr. Fred, I actually can't let you go without asking one more question that just popped uh. up when you were talking about the invitation to be aligned with who you truly are and asking all of us to do that again and step into that. What was your greatest fear or resistance for you to move through in order to align to you? I think I think that the greatest fear was that somehow, um, you know, by being sensitive, I was now get hurt. You know, mm. everyone's greatest fear, like by really exposing my heart or really saying what matters to me, that I would get a cruel world would just eat me for lunch. You know, is that is that in fact, I have to be a tough guy, I have to have a you know deep veneer, I have to say things I don't believe. Uh, in order to protect myself. So that that's why I always point to that. I think that that's really representative of a lot of our society, that we're afraid that if we speak our true voice, we'll get in trouble. Mm -hmm. And so we don't do it at, at what cost? Well, I would say at this point, if you don't want to speak your true voice, you're going to die a life without anyone ever knowing you. Yeah. And if that sounds okay to you, well, then that's fine. But the truth is going through life without anyone ever knowing you sounds horrible to me. And without your true voice, no one will ever know you. And, you know, without your voice, no one will ever even hear you. And, and you know, I can be sure that you can be herded, but you cannot be heard without exactly speaking your, your voice. And with true voice, I really believe that we can end all wars, inward and outward. Uh, in fact, it's the only tool we have to end wars, inward and outward. And when we choose not to do that, well, then we're going to be responsible for the future we get. And we've already discussed the possibility that future might be pretty grim and pretty mm. bleak. And so if we're going to do anything about it, now's the time to do it. And you're the one to take it on. Yeah. Wow. And I can attest to that as well. You know, even ending all war wars, inward and outward, like I was terrified to use my voice. And I remember years and years and years ago, nearly as teenagers, even a friend saying to me, my best friend at the time going like, who are you? I don't even know you because I was so shut down and everything. And it's been one of the greatest gifts as well to start using my voice. And I don't just mean in podcasting, but just in general in my life. And it's just it's liberating, but it can seem scary, you know, sometimes having those hard conversations or sharing what's on your heart. But like you say as well, when you're sharing that authenticity, it actually doesn't go like we think it's going to go in our heads. So yeah, 
I love it. And thank you so much, Dr. Fred, for joining, for sharing and yeah, for doing what you're doing. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for acknowledging that. And thank you for having me on a really great conversation. Fabulous questions. You did a great job. Thank you.